Hi guys, how are you today? Uh, it's a cool one, but it's sunny. It's beautiful here today. A typical fall day here in the Maritimes, a little bit cool, nice bright sunshine. Trees are starting to change color. It's a little earlier than usual, but they're starting to change color, which I love because I have this amazing empire maple in my front yard and it turns the most extraordinary colors at this time of year. Fall is the catchword for today. We are painting Always Be Thankful. Um, I thought this would be a fun piece, something a little more traditional, but um, something without flowers. Um, and I, I like it. I think the colors are perfect for this time of year. So we're going to enjoy that. It includes doing some, a little bit of stenciling and some color washing techniques and then some fun techniques to paint the pumpkins. But before we get started with that, I do have a couple of things. Uh, we do have a winner for, for our live last week, which is Paula Ransdell. You have won a set of the Dynasty Pro stencil brushes. So uh, make sure you message me with your shipping information, Paula, and we will get those out to you right away. The other thing, we don't have a live next Saturday. I'm taking a day off because I've got to get some painting done. I have a bunch of designs sitting here and no time to get them finished. So I'm taking next Saturday off. However, we are going to film something for you this week so that you have something to occupy yourselves <laughs> on Saturday. So no live next Saturday, but there will be a video. So you'll be able to watch. All right, I think we're just about ready to get started. So this is the piece we're working on today. Um, always be thankful. It involves a little bit of lettering. Uh, we're going to be working with an, a zero rigger for this one. Uh, we're going to use some paint point blenders to do some of this dry brushing and a couple of fun little techniques to do the wheat. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some small details that have big dividends. So this is the piece we're going to work with. I have one prepped, uh, but uh, let's get started with that background. So the surface of this has been base coated with two coats of burnt orange. That's the Decorts burnt orange. I love this color. It's nice and rich. It's very opaque, so it covers really, really well. And it's the ideal base for our thankful sign. So I've got that two coats, burnt orange, nice and opaque. And then you're going to work with my you guessed it, Ashfaltum. Oh my goodness, this bottle is almost empty. Okay. So you're going to need a stencil brush. I've got a, of course, they're both wet. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm working with a three quarter this is the Dynasty Stencil Pro. We want a nice smooth finish on this one, so I'm going to use this particular brush and a little bit of asphaltum. So just pick up a small amount on your brush and then swirl it in both directions so that you get a nice even distribution of color on that brush. Now the stencil we're going to work with is the one inch Buffalo Check. And I like to take my stencil off the surface just slightly. It just implies that that design continues elsewhere. So in a circular circular fashion, my tongue's not working today, and you're going to change directions frequently. Now you notice that I have taped this in place because I don't want this to shift while I'm working. So you're going to work over that burnt orange with the asphaltum. Now the reason I chose the as asphaltum for this is that it is not an opaque color, it is transparent. And so you don't get this hard, flat brown, you get a nice, rich, deeper tone of that burnt orange. So it's a softer contrast with that orange. If I went to a dark brown, it would be very hard and harsh. So I went to a transparent brown so that I would get a nice transition of color. And I like how this looks. This, it's very soft looking, more like a fabric than, than a printed pattern. 
So it's taped in place. So if I at any time want to check and see how it looks, I can simply just lift up the stencil and then come back in with my stencil. Just like that. So you continue to do this until you have the whole surface covered. So I'm going to finish out just this section and then we'll move on to talking about the glazing. Now I really like this buffalo check and uh, there's two different sizes available on my website. We have the half inch and we have the one inch buffalo check. The reason that I went to the, the half inch for smaller things and then the one inch on this larger surface is because that smaller one gets very busy looking. And in a design like this, it would begin to compete and it would look very, very busy in the background. So I went to a one inch that was more in keeping with this design. There we go. So now I'll check. Yes, I'm happy. So in order to continue this, you have to line up this stencil. So line it up cleanly. Tape it in place. And then you can continue. Just like that. Easy peasy. I love, love this Buffalo Check stencil. It lends itself very well to such a wide range of designs. And it works so well, particularly for seasonal things. And Buffalo Check is so hot, it's everywhere. I went into Michael's the other day and I don't think there's a pumpkin there with a ribbon on it that isn't a Buffalo Check. And Sandy posted uh, shots from a Hobby Lobby in Georgia and Buffalo Check was everywhere in the black and white and in this rust color. You know, it's everywhere. And it's so, some of the dishes are really, really cute with the Buffalo Check on them. All of the seasonal stuff just looks so nice with that Buffalo Check. So I'm going to check my stencil. Yep. And again, I'll line it up one more time. Make sure it's secured in place. And then. The nice part is that this Buffalo check does not have to be perfect. In fact, it's a little more interesting when it's not. If it's, you know, perhaps a little darker here and a little lighter there, I like how that kind of lends itself well to country themed or farm themed decor pieces. It's just, it's very pretty. Okay, just about there. Just got this little bit left to do. This is always a difficult where the stencil runs out at the end getting that, that coverage in there. There we go. All right. So I'll just check. Yep, that looks pretty good. Oh, little spot right there. There we go. Nice. So there is our background. Oh, I lost my line. There we go. Now, this darkened edge all the way around the outside of this plaque is actually very easy to do and it's done with my high-tech applicator a shop towel and i make a little pillow out of it so crumple one and tuck it inside the other until you have this little pillow and this is what you're going to work with that's what you're going to apply that color around the outside edge with so the next color i'm working with is soft black. I like this black on oranges and reds because it has a slight reddish undertone to it and so it marries very well to these bright oranges and reds. It's ideal for this. So I'm going to pick up a small amount of the soft black 
on that. It's wet, but it's not drippy. And I'm going to start with the outside edge and work in a circular fashion and change direction. Just like this. And I pay a little attention to those corners. I want those corners a little darker. And you can see how this instantly gives you that aged look all the way around. Circular fashion, it's a nice tight circle. I'm not, not big looping circles, nice tight circles. And I always put the paint on the same place towards this and leave this relatively clear. And that helps blend that color in. So I come around to this side and we'll just quickly do this. Now I know in a lot of my designs, I tend to do those corners and soften it. And I always keep this center section fairly light. The reason for that is that the bulk of this design work is going to fit right in here. And having that lighter area draws the attention to the important portion of this. So the word thankful and these pumpkins are where all of the visual interest is. And so to highlight them, I keep that section of the design as bright as I can. Just like that. Now that corner where the pumpkins are going to sit, you want to get that fairly dark. And you can always repeat this. If you're not happy with it, you can go back around, make it darker if you want to. And along the bottom. Now ordinarily, I take that stencil design all the way down to the bottom. And this, this is just a demo, so I'm not finishing it out. But there we go. I like those corners to be nice and dark. And then that center area is the brightest. Just like that. So it's an easy background to do. This works up very quickly. If you find that this area is perhaps too bright and it looks like you have a bar all the way around it, just take a bit of the soft black, thin it out with water, and then just put a light coat over your surface, just a slip slap of it, and it will subdue this enough and it will get rid of that line. So there's our background. So the only thing left to do with this is to set aside to dry and then you can deepen corners after it's dry. If you find that it's not quite dark enough for your taste, you can continue to layer. It's one of the nice things about working with acrylics, especially with colors that are more transparent, is that you can layer them up until you get exactly what you're looking for. So we're going to switch over. I have one already prepared. So these pumpkins in this corner, I've base coated the pumpkin, the orange one, with this new color from Decor, it's called Warm Sunset. It's a very nice orange. It's perfect for this, absolutely perfect for this. So we have a little of that Warm Sunset. Now the pumpkin in front here is an older Americana color. This one is oyster beige. I know it looks white, but it's actually beige. So we've got the oyster beige. And the leaves are all base coated with antique green. You'll notice that I went all Americanas today. Usually I have a lot of fluid acrylics in them, but I went all with Americanas today. I really like this piece, it's very pretty. And what else do I need? Oh, I need golden straw. This is another older color in the Americanas. This is that lovely yellow. It's a kind of muddy yellow, but it's perfect for what we're doing today. So I'm going to dig out. Now I have my pumpkins base coated already. So these leaves are going to get a nice coat of antique green. I think probably my favorite green. 
I love how this looks. I just love the tone of it. It's very earthy and warm. I like that green. And it's ideal for this autumnal theme that we're doing. Now, when I base coat, you'll notice I always paint in the shape of the leaf. The shape of the petal, of the shape of the pumpkin. The strokes always follow the general shape. I just find that it helps you in the end when it comes to adding details and, and shadows. It also helps that you don't really need to base coat two or three times. Most of the time one coat will do. Except for really transparent colors. There we've got our leaves, a couple of them. And there is one back here, right behind this pumpkin. In here. Okay, so the pumpkins are going to get uh, shaded. That's our next step. We're going to shade them with asphaltum. I know you're terribly surprised, but the asphaltum is, is a great color for shading these pumpkins. Again, because it's transparent, so it's going to darken that orange and darken that oyster beige enough but without killing the color. If I used a black on this or soft black might have been too much for that orange so I went to the asphaltum. So let's start with this pumpkin in the background. So you're going to float this color. I have a fair amount of water in this brush and a fair amount of paint. And we're going to start with shading behind these leaves. And don't be shy with that color. It's a great color for this orange. In every one of those curves of this pumpkin, you're going to float in that asphaltum. In behind here. This will just help shape that pumpkin quite a bit. I'm gonna rinse, I picked up some green on my brush, so I didn't intend to, but I did. So you can deepen that. Every time you go back over it, that color gets a little bit stronger. And we need it fairly strong back here because it's tucked in behind this little white pumpkin in front. Just like that. So you can tell these are not neat and tidy floats. I'm not a neat and tidy floater. I'm more interested in just getting the color in there and I like the texture that that sort of pity pat technique gives me. Now I'm coming down to this one. You'll notice when I base coated this one that I left a lot of this stria. I wasn't really too fussy about getting it perfectly opaque, mainly because I like that texture that it creates. And because I painted it in the shape of each of those segments, it lends itself very well to helping you create that texture that's in pumpkins. Instead of looking very polished, it looks like it has that texture. So I'm just pulling that asphaltum in there. A 
I like these pumpkins. And again, those that stria, those lines that I created when I was base coating this piece have helped create that texture of that pumpkin. And white pumpkins are very trendy right now. Every place I go, there's white pumpkins. Every home decor store, every shop, they all have white pumpkins in the windows. That, and there's lots of bits of gold and buffalo check and all kinds of fun things. There. So there, our white pumpkin is really coming together. And it's a soft, kind of rustic look, so it works for this. Now, there's an interesting technique using a paint roller, those fabric paint rollers that you can get at Home Depot. If you put your base coat down with a fabric roller, it creates almost a, a pebbled effect on the surface. So that when you're doing this type of, of shading and then you're doing all of the dry brushing for the highlights, it creates a really neat texture in the finished piece. Not to mention it's really fast for base coating. <laughs> there we go. All right. I think our pumpkins are just about there. I'm going to switch over to, I'm using a small round, I'm going to paint in the stems of my pumpkins. And I'm using antique green. I do have some margarita or some matcha green to do the highlights, so you got to have those highlights. These pumpkins actually work up very quickly because you don't have to putz with the with the base coat. Just get some color on there. I used one coat of the Oyster Beige for the white pumpkin and I used two coats of the Warm Sunset for the orange one. There we go. Now I washed out one of my leaves here and I floated. So I'm just going to fill them back in. And there's these little leaves are in a few places. There's one up here. They're just little filler leaves. They just fill in spaces, make things a bit interesting and keep things looking soft and not quite so stilted. So I like tucking those little clusters of leaves in everywhere. So there's another set down here. Now something I don't ordinarily put in fall designs is wheat. And I don't know why I suddenly thought about it the other day that wheat is such a great thing to tuck into places as filler because it also changes the color so you get you know punches of yellow so it gives you an opportunity to bring in some other autumnal colors other than just you know the usual reds and greens so I the wheat idea sort of just came to me so <laughs> I really like that now the wheat I'm painting with a round and I, I kind of want this to load up but this one is just a nice little round it is a number four but I wanted a round because that technique so you start at the base of it and it's just a an incomplete comma stroke I did not I got too much water in it still have too much water in it okay maybe I need a different brush there we go. 
I'm going to take my little piece of shop towel here and wipe that off. There we go. And I switched over. This one is a number two in the black gold. Let's see if this works better for me. Yes, it did. So it's sort of an incomplete comma stroke and I let it sort of get rough at the end. Just like that. So it just creates a teardrop and then you pull it to a point. So press down, roll the brush between your finger and then draw it up back up to the point. Press down, roll the brush, bring it to the point. Got a question from Alice. Alice has a question. What is it? What font do you use for the writing? Uh, the font that I used for this one is, <laughs> I gotta think for a second, I believe it's called Sweetheart. And if you're looking for it, it's available on uh, fontbundles.com. I use font bundles quite a bit. I really like the selection they have and they're very affordable. But I believe this one is called Sweetheart. It's a pretty font. This style of, of, um, of font lettering these days is very, very popular. And so, and loading, buying an individual font, they're very affordable. And then you have license to use it. Um, of course, there's some nice fonts that are available just in your computer as well, but in general, I, I like to look for trendy, elegant looking, and pretty delicate looking lettering. And this one in particular really caught my eye. I really like the look of it. Oops, there we go. So there's our wheat. I mean, it's not fancy, not even really pretty comma strokes, but it's just to get that texture that we want in that wheat. So it's just a touch and then roll the brush between your fingers and draw it to a point like that. And because it's wheat, we don't really need it to be absolutely perfect. That would be boring. And we have some texture to add to this with two other colors yet. So and I like the texture. It's it keeps these from looking too sedate. There we go. Now, we'll talk about this corner for a second. Um, usually when you see something like this, I had somebody ask me the other day why I just drew those lines in here when there was only two pieces of wheat showing. Well, if I were to let me grab a liner or a rigger here, if I were to simply put those two stalks of wheat in there. Let me put a line in so I can explain. So there's the two stalks of wheat. Then you would have this gap here and then all you would see is this space, this leaf, and then two pieces of wheat. But if I use that same color to add a few other lines back here, it implies that there's more wheat in the distance or off the page that we can't see. And it just lends a little more balance to the overall design. So now we know that there's wheat growing off in here, we just can't see it. So I'm going to use that rigger and put my line. Now I'm just using a little of that um, golden straw for that 
little line in that sheaf of wheat. Or a stalk of wheat, I should say. It's not a sheaf. So I'm going to give that a second to dry. And we're going to come back to this pumpkin. Uh, we were talking earlier about um, point blenders. I love point blenders. I need my big one. There it is. This is a point blender. This one is the large. My two favorite sizes are the medium and the large. These ones work really, really well. So we're going to highlight these pumpkins. Now, this one in the background, I'm going to use a little of that base color in my brush and blend it out like so. And then pick up just a touch of that oyster beige just to change the value of that orange just a little bit. If you don't like mixing color, you can switch to a lighter color of orange, like tangerine will work really well. And then you just dry brush onto the upper portion here of the, each of those segments. And I need a little bit brighter. I don't quite have, I think the oyster beige was not quite the right color to use for that. So I'm going to try it with the, a little of that white. There we go. Much better. There we go. So the highlight is just a dry brush to the upper portion of each of those segments like this. The reason I like doing that with these point blenders is that it's like working with a giant crayon. And if it comes to a nice soft point, you can really get that color in there. And that point gives you a lot of precision about your color placement. So there we go, a little bit there. I'm going to pop a little of it there. I like that precision that you get from that point. And it's a very soft brush, so the, the highlights are very, very soft. Then I take a little of that white. I haven't cleaned my brush yet, and I'm adding a little of that yellow to it. And I'm going to do this again on that upper point, like so. And it is just a dusting, and I'm keeping it fairly small and controlled. It's just a little bit. But what that does is that gives you that light impact point on those higher points of that pumpkin. Just like that. So now I'm just going to rub my point blender on some paper towel to remove the excess paint. And I'm going to pick up a little of that titanium white in that brush. I'll switch to a, a little titanium white and a little bit of that oyster beige. I just want a much lighter value of the oyster. And I'm going to dry brush my highlights onto my pumpkin. And it's the same process. So the highlights are going on the upper left and the left side of that pumpkin. And this is that opportunity to soften some areas, soften those areas where maybe your float line is a little harsh. It just rounds things out nicely. That little bit of titanium white really brightens up this pumpkin. There we go. I never start my highlight with just plain white because once you go to white, you can't go any further. 
you cannot make a white highlight any brighter. So if you're working with a little bit of that oyster beige in the brush, and then just gradually increase the amount of white, then you get nice, soft highlights. And remember, if your highlights, if you've got your highlight on, and it just isn't giving you the contrast that you want, try deepening the shadow opposite of it. And that will give you that little punch. Sometimes it's just you're not quite getting enough contrast. So that's when you break out that. If the highlight won't get brighter, then darken the shadow. There we go. So now we've got a nice bright highlight on our pumpkins. Got a question from Judy. Judy has a question. Does that brush give much softer highlights than using a regular dry brush? I find it does, yes, mainly because the bristle is so much softer. These are a synthetic that they are super, super soft, almost like a pony hair. And yes, they do give very nice soft highlights. You have to work at it a little bit though with a softer brush. It takes a little longer to get where you're going, but you'll get there. Love it. So now we've got the highlights in on our pumpkins and I'm going to use a little asphaltum. If I can find my bottle, there it is. I'm going to add a little shadow to my pumpkins because they, they need to be toned a little bit. So I'm going to pick up a small amount and I'm going to blend it heavily. I'm putting a fair amount of water in this. And this is where I'm going to tone the back of my pumpkin. Right here. So along the bottom, this shades it, rounds it out nicely. Lovely friend named Sandy. Yes, Sandy McTeer. <laughs> <laughs> what did Sandy say? Oh, what about Metzaluna brush for dry brushing versus the IPC? Um, you know what? I love the Metzalunas, but I like them for larger items and things where I want a lot more visual texture. I want a softer, more subtle highlight on this one, and so I go to my IPC brush. Metzaluna is awesome for things like mittens, anything that has a heavy texture, visual texture. Um, but when it comes to doing things that have a smooth surface, I really like my, my IPC. There we go. Okay, so next I want to do a little bit of work on these leaves down here. And I'm going to use matcha green because I cannot seem to locate my one and only bottle of margarita. I think I might be out. If I can get this out of the bottle. There we go. This is matcha green. This is one of the newest greens that DecoArt added this year. Really a nice green. So I'm going to highlight on this side with just a float. And I take it out to the point and a little at the outside edge and take it out to the point. This green has a fair amount of white in it, so it is quite opaque. So I thin it out quite a bit for this. So there is my highlight on this side. And I take it all the way out to the point. And I like to take a little bit on the underside of the leaves too. Just like that. I think we should mention Viking. Oh! 
So if you're looking for this surface, um, there's two places you can get it. Viking Wood Crafts has it also, and so does CD Wood. So if you're looking for it, Cupboard Distributing has it available, as does Viking Wood Crafts. I'm not sure of the item number, but uh, just look up arched plaque, and this one is uh, 6 by 14. So I'm putzing with this and making a mess of it. So I'm going to stop putzing, or so I said. There we go. Okay, so I have my highlights in place. I'm going to give that a minute to dry. So while that's drying, I'm going to take my rigger. This is a zero. And I'm going to thin out a little bit of that matcha green or margarita or whatever color you're using. And I'm going to put a nice little highlight on my stems like so. I like this green especially for the, the little vines and tendrils that you have. It's a really pretty green. There's those little tendrils. Oh, I do like tendrils. Curly cues, whatever you want to call them. They're great for adding texture and filling up space, but doing it softly. So to shade that leaf, I think we're dry. Oh, I'm going to dry this. Hang on just a sec. So I could not find my plantation pine. I think I might be out. So I'm going to resort to a little bit of fluid acrylic. I'm just going to use a little of the sap green. And this is the shading color, plantation pine or sap green, for these leaves. I like this green because it's dark but it's very transparent. And so it will give you that deepness, those wonderful deep shadows, but without being muddy or burying too much of the original colors. So I'm just separating those leaves, putting in a nice weak float in here. Remember, there's a leaf back here that you have to separate as well. And now is your chance to do it. The little of that sap green or plantation pine. And right down that center vein. I have a visitor again today. It has been wreaking havoc down here the last few days. So there are our leaves. I'm going to take that same color and this is going to shade the back half of our pumpkin stem. And don't forget it's going to get down into that area here. So now I want to come out and let's talk about these sheaths of wheat. Now the color that I use to shade it um, is spiced pumpkin, but seems to be another color that has vacated the premises. Oh, I found it. Spiced pumpkin. My other favorite orange. This is a great color. So I'm going to put a little spot of that on my palette. And I'm going to switch to a smaller angle if I can find one. Here it 
this. So I'm going to pick up a small amount of that spiced pumpkin and I'm going to blend it out well. And this is where we're going to come in and just at the base of each one of those little bits of wheat, we're going to put a sea stroke type float at the bottom. Like so. And it's a small float, doesn't have to be wide, it's just at the base of that grain on each one of those little comma strokes that we did for the wheat. Easy peasy. Are the paint bottles hiding today? The paint bottles are hiding. <laughs> Too many of them, they get in the way and block the camera. So that little bit of orange just pops those, gives them a little dimension. Keeps them from looking a little too yellow and definitely keeps them from looking too flat. And it's a nice punch of color. Like so. I've just got one little bit left to do up here. It's a very pretty orange. Now we're going to do another step right after this and you'll understand why I wasn't too worried about getting them utterly perfect as far as the comma strokes go. Wheat has these long points that come off of it, and so we have to put those in. So I'm going to find my, I have a nice long liner here somewhere. Oh, there it is. I'm using, this one is a 5 aught script, nice long 5 aught, and I'm going to use some Sunny Day, which is that bright yellow, that right really pretty pretty yellow I love this one it's one of my favorite yellows in the Americanas it's so pretty camera guy keeps giving me the gears about my me setting paint bottles in front of the camera so I'm going to load up the script Get a little more water in there here we go now I'm going to start at the bottom of these wheat sheaves right here and I'm going to put like a fine line. It acts like a highlight on that comma stroke and I just pull that line past the point of the wheat like so. And I'm going to do it on the other side of this as well. So this gives that wheat a sort of a little bit of a bushy effect so that it doesn't look quite so flat. And it softens the look of this design as a whole, having that fine point coming off of the wheat. So we have a brighter value of yellow that just adds to this as far as I can as I see. And it adds to that layered effect. So it gives you the impression that this is sitting on top of each other. So you do a little bit there. So that little punch of yellow, that bright punch of yellow that we put in here, 
just softens this whole thing. And you can overstroke this as much as you want until you're happy with it. I really like how it softens the look of the wheat. Just like that. Such an easy little detail to put in, but it's not structured. It is not, we're not looking for the perfect line work with this. You want this to have that soft, almost as if it just sort of happened. But it gives that wheat a softer feel. like that and you can highlight some of those lines that we put in earlier just with a fine line and don't forget a little bit on that center line there is not a bad idea either there we go and that's how you do the wheat it's so simple it's quite effective. It looks really nice on this surface. So we've done pumpkins and we've done wheat. I'm going to bring in a little more highlight on this pumpkin stem. I'm just going to mix a little titanium white. It's not quite bright enough to suit me. There we go. And I'm just using fine lines to add that texture to the stem. Little highlights. And this is a good time to add highlights to those little leaves here too. Now, one of the things I love doing around leaves especially larger leaves than on a surface like this. The, the style of painting is loose and soft. And so to make the leaves look loose and soft, I just use some very fine lines just to sort of scribble around the leaf. It just gives the leaves a softer appearance. And I do it to all of these little leaves too. Hi Debbie, how are things in Texas? I have the pattern, but I can't find what color the stems are. Help, please. The stems? The stems. The stems on what? The wheat? The stems on the wheat are the uh, golden straw, and the stems on the pumpkins are antique green, just like the leaves. So, we are down to brass tacks. It is, um, we're just going to add a couple of little curly cues and vines just to keep things, you know, soft and pretty. And again, I'm just using a little bit of that thinned matcha green. Carol Eves. Carol Eves. The arch top sign from CD Wood is a 6x12. 6x12, yes. But your video says 6x14. Yes, that. Get the 6x14. <laughs> the 6x14, that was my error. It is 6x12. I apologize for that. The surface is 6x12. So I've got a few little vines and tendrils. Those are just highlighted in with a little of that matcha green and a little of the antique green just to make them nice and solid, like so. So last but not least, we have to talk about the lettering. Now I'm using a zero rigger today for the lettering. The zero is very fine and this lettering is quite fine. So. Let's. Now the color I used for this is warm white. 
You could also use the oyster beige if you wanted to, but I'm using warm white. It's my usual go-to color. A little bit of warm white. And I'm using that zero rigger. I like how this zero fits this particular font size very, very well. So for those of you who haven't played with um, lettering or haven't done the lettering the way I do, there is a way to load this brush. So the paint should be quite thin, a little thicker than milk. And you're going to load it up. Like That brush has got lots of paint in it, right to the ferrule. And then I press my brush on the surface to flatten it out and it creates a chisel edge. You see, it looks almost like a flat brush as opposed to a liner. So, turn it so that you're on the chisel edge. Press down on the brush to open it up till it fills the space and then bring it back up onto the chisel edge. And you can do all of those vertical segments of the lettering that easily. It takes a little bit of practice, but it's worth it. That chisel edge, turn it on its side, you can use it to do that fine line, like so. Chisel edge, press down to open the brush up till it fills the space, and then stand it up on the chisel edge. And again, don't forget to tap that brush down so that it forms that chisel edge so it looks square. Start at the top of the letter on the chisel edge, press down till the brush opens up and fills the space and bring it back up onto the chisel edge. This type of lettering can be very relaxing. So I'm going to just cruise through this. Chisel edge. A little tight on that one, so press down to open it up and come back up onto the chisel edge. Now I like to do all of my vertical portions first because then I can come in and I can fix all those little tiny lines and details after the fact. Oops, need a little bit of water, some more paint, tap it flat, see how it's flat. Chisel edge, press down to open up the brush and then come back up on the chisel edge. And the trick to doing lettering is quite simply taking your time. If you mess it up, take a Q-tip, wipe the paint off and try it again. And having the right brush to do this type of thing makes a world of difference. And I've only found that this rigger is that brush for me. And it is an easy one to control. It looks like a liner brush, but it isn't. It's not even built like one. It's got a round ferrule, much like a, a liner brush does. But the hairs are arranged so that they form a straight edge or a chisel edge in this case.
and it's easy to fix any little baubles or whoopsies. They're going to happen. They happen. <laughs> One just happened there. There we go. Now, if you can practice to the point where you can pull this lettering in one stroke, each of those long vertical lines, you're going to end up with really nice clean lettering. And it just takes a little practice and a little patience. So there is our connecting lines. Now, something I did forget to do because I whoopsied, got too excited about doing the lettering. One thing that I did forget to do was to put the shading around the lettering, and I usually do that before I paint it. I got ahead of myself. So there we are. So once this is completely dry, I'll take a Factus black eraser and it will take out all of those white graphite lines and I'll be left with some nice clean lettering. If you find you have little thin spots or areas where you didn't quite fill the space as much, there's nothing to stop you from going back in. There's a couple of spots here where I find the paint's a little thin. There we go. So ordinarily, I would use soft black to shade this lettering before I actually painted the lettering. But I got a little too excited today. I got ahead of myself. But that little bit of shading makes a world of difference to this lettering. And I like to do it beforehand so that if I have any little baubles or what have you, then the white paint sort of cleans those up. I'm going to finish this off and then grab my small angular. This one is a 3 8 And I'm going to pick up a little bit of soft black. And I'm going to blend it well. I don't want this full strength. And those shadows will go in here on the right side of each letter. And it's just a simple little float tucked in to all of these spaces on the inside right on the background. So that little float will make all the difference on how this lettering looks and it'll lift it up off the surface a little bit. And I do like lettering to not look so flat. It has to be interesting and having it hover slightly over that surface, cast little shadows, just creates a little more interest in this piece. Makes it visually interesting. Just got one more. I'm going to tuck that in on there. So in those curves and curls, in that lettering, that shadow makes a huge difference. Just lifts it and makes it more interesting. So there we have it. We have our lettering in place. We have our pumpkins done. We have our leaves done. We have our wheat done. So let's do talk about doing a couple of little finishing tricks to this. And one of my favorites, especially with anything related to farmhouse or country or in this case this fall or autumnal look I have to spatter everything I like things spattered so I'm going to pull a little bit of warm white and it's on my fugly brush the fugly brush this is my big one inch oval in the encaustic and I'm going to spatter this lightly with some thinned warm white I don't want a ton of it on here a little bit and rinse my brush and let's do that again but we're going to do that with a little soft black so 
I grab some water and a little soft black this time. And again, I like the finer spatter. Miss Sandy likes the tap method. I like this method. If I had an old toothbrush, I would use it. So there we go. A little spatter of the soft black. I'm gonna use my heat gun to dry this real quick. And out comes my favorite, my premium Primo gold paint pen. I love this. And I like taking this pen around the edges like so, so that it adds a fine bead of the gold to the front. Like that. I love how it finishes this type of thing. It just looks so nice and that little flash of gold with all of those colors just looks great. And it gives it such a nice professional looking finish. And I make sure that I cover the whole edge of the surface as well. So that little touch, that little tiny touch of the gold trim on the front just gives it a little bit of sparkle, makes it a little more interesting. And that's it. That's as difficult as that piece gets. Hi guys. Thanks again for joining me. I really do appreciate that you come and see me every Saturday. I really do. It's fun for me. Hopefully you get a lot out of it and that you learn something new every, every Saturday. Hopefully that's my goal. Next Saturday, I have a day off, but there will be a video posted for you to play with. I've got a couple of ideas for some nifty little Christmas ornaments and um, probably be showcasing a new Halloween piece too. Got a couple of those up my sleeve. So we have quite a bit um, in store for you for next week, even though we won't actually be going live. Don't forget to hit the comment button, share the video, go to the YouTube channel, so subscribe to my YouTube channel because we have videos there every week. We post a new one on Thursday. So go and have a look for that as well. I do have a giveaway this week. I have a gorgeous little surprise pack for somebody. So it's got a combination of products in it. So somebody's getting a goodie bag in the mail. So hit the subscribe button on my YouTube channel. Leave a comment in the comment section. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy. Love ya. See you again soon.